tenakoto kato haere mai ki tenehui, te iwi o rangatane tenakoto, 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 tenatato kato. Thank you. Turn myself off. Thank you all for coming back um, for our quarter to two start. Um, we will get through the items that we can early. So as I indicated, that involves bringing forward um, item number 11. But we'll go to the beginning of the agenda, having already taken apologies. Um, we've been through the housekeeping, and I don't think there's anybody in who's not familiar with this venue. So we'll take that as flowing through. Um, not any notification of additional items. I will note that there was an additional piece of information been put on your desks. This is not an additional item. It's information that should have included in an item which is already on the agenda. So apologies that that was not picked up in the administration process. Are there any other additional items? Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I, can I just ask, it's a fairly significant bit of uh, additional item to be dropped with five minutes notice around the finances and there's some fish hooks in them already that I've noted. So how did that get missed? I mean, is this something that is, where did it come from? If I could ask the general manager to comment. Um, my understanding, it was a late swap out. We didn't, didn't double check that it was included. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll leave it to comments when, when, our, when our guests arrive. Thank you. Thank you. So item three, are there any declarations of interest? Being none, any public comment? Don't expect so, thank you. So we will move as indicated to item 11, which is the military heritage update. And I'll invite David Murphy, city planning manager to come and speak to that. Thank you, David. Page 107 on the agenda. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Councillors, uh, the Mayor. Uh, I'm just going to talk briefly to the, the short memorandum on the order paper. Um, I guess just before I do, I just want to acknowledge the work of um, Victoria Edmonds, a planner in strategy and planning that's um, um, prepared, prepared the report with the support of um, Leslie Courtney uh, from the library. I think Leslie's on her way. Oh, she is. It's arrived. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I, I guess just a couple of points uh, I'd like to emphasize is, um, you know, th this this report covers, um, you know, work across the organization. So, um, you know, we, we've seen um, activities and, and, and actions, you know, from the library, community, planning, events, and infrastructure staff. So, I guess want to Emphasise them here, sort of on be, on behalf of a wider organisational team that has has been looking at how we incorporate military heritage across a, a range of activities. Um, you know, it's it's deliberately not a detailed report. I think we're not intending to provide detailed information on the individual military heritage activities. It's more just to demonstrate to to the committee and the council that um, the direction the council made about ensuring that we're looking at military heritage opportunities across the city. Um, as they're available is is um, is, is happening, um, and um, you know, uh, and you know, I think I think the the report demonstrates um, good good progress in a number of areas, and, and acknowledge that there's certainly um, opportunities uh, that we need to be conscious of going forward as well. You know, there's some good work happening at the arena, um, but we know there's further upgrades planned for Cuba Street, which which do present real opportunities in terms of that physical infrastructure space. Um, bearing in mind a lot of the examples in this annual update are, are sort of more events community-based um, research library activities. So um, there was an email from Joe Hollander, which was, uh, I know, uh, circulated to the, the chair and a number of councillors. Um, I thought I might just briefly touch on some of the comments in, in that email. I know Joe was planning on being here. Um, so there was a few things that Joe identified that um, he thought should be in the report. And um, the first one was the monthly midday military heritage presentation. Um, and I guess we just clarify and I'll check this with Leslie that, you know, that isn't a council activity. It's, it's sort of something that's um, um, promoted by Joe and, and, and that group. Um, I guess that means, you know, in, in future with these reports, whether we include sort of uh, activities that are 
associated with council activities or in council buildings, we, we can think about that. Um, the 2020 Armistice Day um, um, ceremonial activities, um, acknowledge that that should have been included. That's an oversight. So um, thank you for Joe to pick that up. I guess the Cuba Street redevelopment, I guess the, the work that happened at Cuba Street was sort of, um, I guess the early stage of the design of that happened as we were sort of getting direction around, around the military heritage. And as I've said earlier, I think the future work at Cuba Street is a real opportunity and making sure that the infrastru infrastructure staff um, are, are looking at opportunities for that. Um, the Awapuni Medical Memorial to Heritage New Zealand Park. Um, again, this has um, largely been a conversation between Joe and Race. Uh, we did connect Joe and Race with Heritage New Zealand to arrange the plaque. Um, again, that might be one that, in, in, you know, in hindsight we could have included, but it's not an explicit thing that the council um, has let out. The 2020 New Zealand Military Tattoo and 2020 Anzac Day um, events were obviously cancelled due to COVID. Um, I think they, they were in an initial draft of the report, but we sort of ended up taking those out because it was relatively obvious as to the reasons why they um, didn't happen. But again, maybe the report could have explicitly said why they were um, why they were cancelled. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, as I said, we've got Leslie and Victoria there if, if there's anything I can't answer. Um, but as I said, it's um, it's something, it's, it's a bit of a work in progress. This is a new way, I guess, of, of emphasising that we're trying to deliver heritage across a range of, um, or military heritage across a range of council activities. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. I'm um, just noting that the original um, recommendation that brought this report on as an annual report onto our agenda was 2018. I just wondered for the benefit of those of us with short memories or who weren't around the table in 2018, whether you could comment on why we're taking this approach of an annual report on military heritage, because that was a decision made by elected members. Yeah, no problem. So, so there was talk of a, a military um, heritage precinct um, and to help, um, I guess, um, to help with that that request um, or, the, or that consideration, we did some research on where military heritage existed across the city. Um, and what that research indicated very clearly was that there was military heritage um, across the whole city, um, from, you know, a, a Memorial Park down to, um, you know, the Arapuni Racecourse, the arena to Cuba Street. So, so the idea of a precinct when the heritage is citywide is a little bit different, uh, d difficult because the heritage is more a consolidation, a precinct, sorry, is more of a, a consolidation of, of activities in a particular area. Um, so, so the decision was that we would look at applying military heritage um, to existing programs across the city um, as and when opportunities are available. Um, and, and I think we are making good progress on that. Um, there is, is probably still some work to do to make sure new staff coming into the organisation that are responsible for projects are aware of that history and are aware of the research that's available to make sure that the projects they're managing can be influenced in, in that way. But um, that was the sort of background, you know, that the advice, officer advice was that a precinct um, um, was probably not the best option, but the, the, the approach we have taken is, um, and, and I think it's demonstrating that there are, there are opportunities citywide. So. Thank you. So the, the only other question I had was around, and you referenced the good work that's been done at the arena, and we all heard a presentation about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it seemed the success of that approach was in embedding that storytelling it, which includes a military history storytelling approach, embedding it in the infrastructure um, program itself. So how do we learn from that experience at the arena and take that approach into other projects, such as the next Cuba Street upgrade? Yes, so there is some there is um, some really good opportunities at, at the arena, and I've, I've got an update from the, um, the project manager for the arena that's showing that that military heritage will form a key part of the storytelling uh, there. But, but again, I think that the, the basic approach is, you know, understand the history and the stories um, and then look at creative and innovative ways of, of telling that through through the delivery of the infrastructure. So in that sense, I don't think it's, you know, it's not a, I don't think there's any special recipe other than sort of under, understanding the heritage and taking the opportunities when they're available. So as I've said, again, we've got um, upgrades uh, planned for another part of Cuba Street. I think that part of Cuba Street from Pitt down to Pascal will need to be looked at at some point. Um, um, so again, that will present an opportunity. There's some work occurring with the um, the, the Maori Battalion Hall, um, which again, there's, there's a group working on on that, which which again presents some opportunities uh, in the future. Thank you. A question for Councillor Barrett. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, David. Just wanted to ask a question around scope of what we mean when we say military heritage and, and the specific example on my mind um, is around um, Mark Briggs, who was deployed in, in the First World War um, and served as a conscientious objector, um, came back to be our member of parliament, etc. And I remember when we were um, looking at Memorial Park, there was some discussion then around whether um, his um, contribution um, might be recognized um, in the upgrade there. I don't think it's um, come to fruition and haven't sort of seen things signaled here. So I guess treating that as more of an example, just trying to understand if the if the sort of origins of the sort of peace movement that has a very close connection actually with our military history um, comes into scope here or whether some recognition around that aspect would, would be a separate initiative. Leslie's indicating that she um, may be able to assist with that answer. Is that correct, Leslie? Yeah, Leslie, would you like to go down and use the microphone so that it is recorded? Thank you. Um, yes, th thanks for bringing that up, uh, Councillor Barrett. When we have done some initial work on a hero's trail at Memorial Park, Mark Briggs is one of those people, and we d deliberately wanted that hero's trail to not be, you know, a list of VC winners or people who dist were distinguished in battle. It was to acknowledge our local people at home, overseas, or um, did it represented the war in different ways. So I know that uh, that has certainly been signalled for the Memorial Park. Uh, trial as well. Uh, great, thank you for that uh, further information, Leslie. So, just to clarify, where in the process of coming to fruition that is at? Um, it's it's one of the last parts of developing Memorial Park. I think it's uh, it's it's a number of year. It's over a number of years Memorial Park development, and I have a feeling it's in the last year. Do you know the timeline for that, David? I don't offhand, sorry. Yeah. I, I just had a feeling it was it was in the last um, stages uh, that that was coming back. We did some initial research and it was to be used in the future at the end of the project. Suggest so that we get that information circulated because there's nobody from infrastructure in to provide specific comment. But thank you, Leslie, for that, the information. Yes, Can. sorry, just to, so to, to round off my understanding then, I take it from that answer that, that it is very much in scope in terms of um, how we're seeing the development of this over time, not that specific instance, but that the peace movements interface with military heritage is within scope. Yes, uh, my, that's my understanding that it is. Of course, it, I guess it depends um, how it's represented in different projects, but in that particular project, I do know, there's also acknowledgement of the um, of the peace park. Um, this year, you know, we had that wonderful Hiroshima event as yeah. well uh, with IPU. So it's definitely in scope. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, thanks, David, for the report. Um, just in the, under the next steps, it talks about council projects, including Toa or Manawatu, the bronze soldier sculpture. And I had um, thought that that wasn't a council um, project, but could you clarify um, who's driving that project? I suspect while it's not a council project, it's I understand it's going to be located, possibly located on council land or part of that land which is part of the river pathway. So, so the you know council's got a, a role there. Victoria may um, have some more information, possibly. Yes, hello. Um, so the bronze sculpture is being done in collaboration with our parks team and infrastructure and a couple of local artists who are going to be um, doing it. And it's going to be placed on council land along by the river. So it's more of a collaborative project between community and council, but we definitely have a stake in it and we're definitely helping out with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry, it's following up on the same thing. So, um, so my understanding was that um, 
we hadn't committed any council budget towards this bronze soldier sculpture? Are you saying that we are now committing budget? And where's that coming from? Well, I think Victoria's answer was that we're helping to collaborate with the people who are wanting to deliver it um, in terms of a location. Um, that doesn't mean a council budget. Well, other than other than officer time, of course. Well, well, usually when we ask for something to be done, the officer time is is classed as part of the budget. So officer time has to be paid for, doesn't it? Well, again, there's no one from infrastructure here, but I can follow that up and, and get a, a response to you in terms of what the exact council contribution is to that project. Yes, yes, I'd very much like to know. Uh, the other thing is that I was told that it was now going to be um, located at, at the Linton military camp not actually on council land. So could we get that clarified? Yeah, we can we can check that as part of the information. We'll get back to you. Thank you. Uh, so will, will that be at this meeting or later? Because I think that's something that public will be interested in. The general manager is indicating that that's something she's going to take away and bring back. Yes, it's given that there is an um, we haven't got the information available at this meeting, but we'll actually follow that up and get back to you. Thank you. Councillor Meehan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Dave. Um, can you just, you mentioned Mary Battalion. Could you just elaborate on that a little bit more about, you said there was a group working on that. Could you give us who that is and, and what, a bit more elaboration on Mary Battalion? Yeah, I, I know I've had some, some emails forwarded on looking at how that, that the group that's looking at that can secure some funding. Um, and at this stage, the, the response has been because the, the building, in terms of the heritage fund that we have, um, so they're looking at sort of a, a strengthening project and a revitalization project. Uh, all, all the funds that we have are directed towards earthquake prone um, listed heritage buildings um, as, as a priority. So what we've said at this stage is that the current funding guidelines wouldn't support um, a, a contribution to that, but we've encouraged those people to engage in the LTP process. Okay, thank you. Mr. May, did you have your hand up? Yes, yes, Madam Chair, I sort of thought I could have helped because the the, uh, the group that um, are doing the um, uh, the statue out there at uh, near Linton. Um, it's questions, Mr. Mess. Is this a question for the officers or are you? No, I just I, I was just going to say that they actually have come to see us and I understood it was on. I was going to ask them. I understood it was going to be closer because there was some nervousness about being on the, the river pathway that it was going to be almost on the barrier between um, our, our land between Linton and uh, in, in Palmston City's land. That's where I understood it was going to be sited and they were doing the project, not us. I, th I think we've clearly expressed that we'd like some further information on that. If mm. that could be circulated to elected members, that would be great. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you both for presenting and friends. Um, so the recommendation on that item 11 is that the memorandum entitled Military Heritage Update 1920 reported to Arts, Culture and Heritage Committee on 12th of August be received, which I am happy to move. Councillor Barrett will second, and I'll open for any comments. Being none and noting further information to come on that item, we will look to vote on that. Thank you. That is carried with 14 in favour one against and no abstentions. Thank you. Now the gallery who might be a little surprised at where we are in the agenda, you haven't accidentally missed 10 items. Um, we started earlier and picked up item 11. So we're now going back um, in the agenda to item number five which is a presentation from the Palmerston North Heritage Trust. And I, I think I saw Margaret arrive. Yes. So Margaret, if you'd like to come on down and if you have um, anything electronic that needs to be handed over to the committee administrator, Natalia will look after you.
So whenever you're ready, over to you, Margaret, please, 10 minutes. I'm not sure your microphone is on. You have to hold it quite close as well for it to pick up. I hope that's oops, it is better, isn't it? Um, so this is a presentation for information as much as anything, rather than a request for money. Um, about what the Palmerston North Heritage Trust is, because it is sometimes misunderstood. It's a trust um, of council, which is, and there's a group of nine of us who are an administering committee on behalf of the council. So the trust was set up in 1997 by Sir Brian Elwood, the result of a, a small bequest, I must say. And periodically we do get additional funds because we count as being a charity from bodies such as lotteries to do um, some of the work that we do. So we have a range of activities which are mainly to do with promoting history and acknowledging the work of local historians. Um, one of the things that's always quite fun for us to do is, the, is that we do um, a historical calendar on a particular theme each year, which is to show the community that, in fact, photographs, particularly those on Manawatu heritage, are historical sources of interest to the um, community and that Manawatu heritage is a, um, uh, an important place for the, the city's history, both pictorial and increasingly documentary. So we make great, a great deal of use of Manawatu heritage, which is the envy, I must say, of many other places. And I know more and more historians from out, throughout New Zealand are coming to use Manawatu heritage as a source for broader uh, illustrations for broader histories. I've put up there the train ones because <laughs> They were by far the most popular. We always have a sellout when we put a train on the front of a calendar, um, which is encouraging me in future, I think, to do something on the history of the railway through Palmerston North. Um, the one on the, on, on the right is um, from the Tetley paintings, which were previously a fairly underused source from Manawatu Heritage, but a series of beautiful watercolours that were once presented to the um, city. We also acknowledge the work of local historians through the Local Historian of the Year Award. Uh, we can see last year's one there. Um, a, a prize for the best work book on local history, the best article on local history. These are done uh, alternate years. Special recognition contribution to history in the local area. And you'll note there one of the staff from the heritage section uh, where we particularly wanted to acknowledge the work that he and others do on Manawatu heritage is a vital historical source. We also um, give out grants and other supports from our, our modest funds. Um, we organize and host an annual meeting of history groups, and that's not just Palmerston North, but we go as far afield as Rangatike. We sometimes have people come over from Hawke's Bay, from um, down the Kapiti Coast, to talk about how they're handling heritage issues uh, in their particular areas. We give small grants to projects, so the um, interpretive board round on Savage Crescent, for example, we made a small grant to the local branch of what was then the Historic Places Trust. Um, Gary O'Neill's benefited from a grant for his books on Palmerston North Suburbs. We have in some years, though not perhaps more recently, given a prize to secondary school students projects that use local history resources. And with the changes that are proposed for the history syllabus in schools, we want to make sure that our students are actually getting into local history and finding out about the history of this area. And we're, going, we're starting to work both with Massey, um, with Tamanua, and with local his, um, history teachers to try and see what's the best sort of packages we can put together to help teachers teach about the history of Palmerston North in the surrounding area. Um, last year, we organised the digitisation of Massey theses and research exercises on the Manawatu more generally, and we apply for external grants, as I, I've already mentioned lotteries, but we have, uh, one of the first things we did as a group was to get money from the Gaming Trust to organise Ian Matheson's archive, which was an, um, a massive material that needed to be put in order. And um, I had hoped to be able to flash around our new history of Palmerston North that we've sponsored. You can see from the page proofs, it's going to be a fairly major piece of work. Uh, we're expecting, we were expecting the um, advanced copies today, and, but you'll see there the beautiful cover, a painting by John Coley, who grew up in Palmerston North, now lives in Auckland, but gave permission for us to use his um, 1990s painting of the square 
And if you read the book, you'll find out the story behind the red smudge on the left-hand side where the railway lines are. Use your imagination there. Um, one of the things we're planning for next year, around about February, is to organise a conference on, on local history as um, our contribution to centennial activities. But I suppose the book's been our biggie. We didn't start it out intending it to be linked with the centennial, uh, sorry, the sesquicentennial. Um, but um, it's, uh, I think you'll find it's a very good resource to have in place. So that's basically what we're doing, what we're doing. Thank you, Margaret. I was pleased to hear that not all your calendars involve trains. <laughs> Certainly not. We have had women, <laughs> children, animals, the works. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with trains. Um, any questions from elected members? Mr Mayor. Thank you, Margaret, and thanks for all your contribution, especially on that fine piece of work on the screen there now. Are you still going to do the journal this year, or has there been so much going on that the journal's having a year off? No, no, the journal comes out every year. It's not actually under the um, auspices of the Heritage Trust, but right. many of us are actually on both committees. But no, the journal was actually... Should be out next week, I think. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you. I don't think there are any other questions. So thank you very much, Margaret, for coming in um, to tell us about the work of the Heritage Trust. And um, thank you to you and the small team, I know, who are at the heart of that. Thank you. The recommendation is that the presentation be received for information. I'll move that and seconded by Councillor Barrett. Any comments before we vote on that? Then we'll put that to the vote. Thank you. Carried unanimously. Our second presentation this afternoon is from Manawatu Theatre Society and Manawatu Youth Theatre, both represented today by Graham Johnson, who's just coming forward. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Graham Johnston. Um, currently, I am the chairperson of Manawatu Theatre Society and the founder of Manawatu Youth Theatre. Um, today, I'm going to speak on both of those particular societies, both of which receive um, quite constant and um, great funding from both um, the creative communities area of the council and also the CCOs um, locally. So, um, boom, that's what we do. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of history. We've been around since 1903 in various uh, forms. We present musicals and plays, and we are also um, a constitutional member of the Globe Theatre. We were a financial input into the original Globe Theatre and has been our home ever since 1982. Um, so, uh, this year has been interesting. So like most theatre societies, pretty much the first half of the year was a big blob of nothing, um, where we attempted to have meetings and bits and pieces. Uh, we also discovered that constitutionally we had, um, due to a few uh, clerical bits and pieces, um, lost a lot of our membership. So we uh, have spent a lot of the time making sure that we are abiding by the requirements of being an incorporated society. Um, so we have built our membership up to a point where we are an incorporated society and have a um, you know, correct quorum and bits and pieces. Um, what we're looking at doing this year is we have had one of our members um, come to us and present an opportunity to present Pirates of Penzance, which um, is, when was that written? 1857, I think, was the time that was written. Uh, we are taking to it with a very large broadsword because some of it's highly inappropriate. And uh, for 2020, um, when you talk about orphan asylums and bits and pieces like that, so um, we've got Val Bolter directing. So Val is a stalwart of Manawatu Theatre. She actually uh, was the choreographer of the first show I was in in 1983. Um, the other thing we get involved in is Globe Events, um, where we can, we supply um, people to help out, front of house, whatever we can do in there. Um, and then in 2021, we are looking at doing a play in April. Uh, and the we have now become part of the National One Act Play Festival. 
um, which we will be bringing back, which used to be a big part of the events calendar, but no longer. Um, and that will be returning. And then a musical back in November. Um, we used to produce a children's musical as part of MTS, but someone started doing that kind of on their own. And that speaks to my kind of next bit, which is this. So for those of you who um, maybe don't have kids, um, Myth or Manawatu Youth Theatre, I started in 2017 with our first production in 2018. Um, we've produced three shows. I just oh, put a pretty little picture there. That's me on the right. Um, so this is why I started it. This is how I grew up in Palmerston North. This is me sitting on the steps of the Abbey in 1983 with Mark Orange and Lorena Brayshaw over there on the sides who are still friends. And um, I wanted to produce and present that opportunity to other people within the Manawatu. So what are we about? We're very much about community. Um, having kids just, I have, a, I have a big belief that a lot of our mental health issues and bits and pieces could be um, fixed or helped why, by having strong communities that kids belong to and whānau that they might be, out, might be outside of their um, family. Um, it's accessible. To be involved with Manawatu Youth Theatre costs absolutely nothing. There is absolutely zero cost to any person to be involved with our shows. Um, it's safe. We have strong adherence to all the child safe policy policies that are written actually into, into constitution, um, which I'll speak to in a second. And most of all, it's fun. Um, if you ever come to one of our shows or um, yeah, attend the Globe and the July school holidays, that's where you that's what you what you have. So what do we do? We do one major annual production. So, so far we've done Seussical Junior, which was a Dr. Seuss show. We've done uh, Alice in Wonderland, and we've done just recently managed to slot in, in amongst COVID lockdowns, The Little Mermaid Junior. Um, we run free workshops. So for all of our shows, we run audition workshops and we um, um, people can just come along and be a part of it. Again, no cost to anybody. Um, and then we also do things like perform at New Year's Eve and bits and pieces like that. So I'm just going to quickly just run through this just so you can have a little bit of what we do. So as you can see, bright, colourful and fun. So this year bought something really, really cool. Our director was 19, our musical director was 17, and our choreographer was 16. They produced creatively the entire show themselves. Um, the oldest person running the show, and I'm talking no adult supervision, the oldest person in the lighting box was 19. Um, the guy who designed our lights, Jonty, was 19. We had a 15-year-old running sound. I had a 16-year-old calling the whole show. Backstage, the oldest person was 22. So giving youth opportunities for leadership and making this all very, very accessible. Um, oh, just going back to that last one, a young girl turned up 15 years old and said, I want to help with costumes. And I went, cool, I need this jacket made by Thursday. And she did it. She amazing, amazing young girl. And she is now coming on as my head costume designer at 16 years old for the show next year. We had 13 sold out shows, $12 a ticket to come to see the show, 60 bucks for a family of five. You don't, you know, it's cheaper than the movies. You can't really get too much more than that. Um, no costs to be involved. And this year we're also taking a group of students up to represent Manawatu at the Junior Theatre Festival in New Zealand, um, hopefully. 
<laughs> you people getting a bit where to from here, which is the big one, of course. Um, next year, I'm about to start work with Jerry about some renovations on the rehearsal room at the Globe to turn that into a teaching space that we can use. Um, and my other big project is I've currently just engaged with um, local Pacific Island and Māori community leaders about producing Moana Junior as a full Māori Pacific Island production at the Regent in April, um, which is another big part of what we want to do is encourage Māori and Pacifica to get involved in, in our world. Um, we also assist other community groups. I've just lent some lights to College Street Normal. For, they were doing an under the sea thing. So we try and take, especially if we've received money and grant money, I kind of believe that's come from the community anyway, so we should support the community by not hiring it, but just letting people use it. And that's us in a nutshell. Boom. What was that, 10 minutes? Whew. Thank you, Graham. You've covered a lot of ground very quickly, so I'll open for questions and Councillor Harpeter. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Oh, sorry, Councillor. Um, a couple of questions. Really good on here. Okay. Really, really good presentation. Um, just wondered first off, how many students are in the group total? So we have 35 to 40 on stage. Um, and just off the top of my head, anywhere between 15 to 25 backstage um, taking part in the, in the set building and crew and painting and bits and pieces. Second questions around um, Centrepoint do a deal where you partner with business to sell tickets to get people in. Does does the Globe do anything like that in terms of selling tickets? And so we've been incredibly lucky. Um, we've been ninety eight percent sold out through our last three productions. Um, I have a philosophy of of putting on shows which is the right show, the right time, at the right price. Um, this, this is a very family orientated thing, so making it accessible to families that in the school holidays money becomes tight and especially post COVID. Um, I haven't needed to at this stage, but I'm not adverse to it. Um, I've always believed because we have received very generous council funding for our first two shows. We didn't receive it last year because I didn't apply for it because I had lots of business funding lined up, which disappeared in about March. Um, of last year, of this year. Holy cow, still this year, <laughs> still going. Um, yeah, does that answer? So absolutely not adverse to partnering with business. Um, I suppose for each show, it, it changes the diversity and, and the kind of the focus of each show changes. So next year with Moana and Aladdin, the, the, the businesses that may want to get involved, um, I have um, engaged Amanda Lindsay um, about working through the Chamber of Commerce to develop stronger partnerships to business and long-term um, arrangements in that scope. And potentially putting your price up? No. Mm -hmm. If you did that? So, the yeah, a lot of people have talked about putting the price up. I, at this stage, won't do it because it would take it away from what it is, what, what it's designed to be. Um, yeah. Graham, I wanted to ask you about the young people, um, particularly that you've got in those leadership roles. How, what advantage is that giving them for the for the future? Are they people who are looking at careers in creative industries? Yeah, so I'll speak to three specifically. So John T. Robinson, who actually got accepted into a into a technical school in Melbourne and came back through, just because of, well, he wasn't quite ready for that jump yet. Um, he this year got awarded the ETNZ Youth Technical Award Scholarship. ETNZ is the entertainment technology New Zealand industry kind of body that, that governs a lot of our health and safety. So um, he's on their radar and that's actually chaired by Vicky Cooksley, who's an ex-Palmerston um, North girl. Um, Sarah Judd um, has just been accepted to the National Shakespeare Festival. Um, and that also affords her the opportunity to possibly go to London um, which, you know, maybe, okay. <laughs> depends on when, when that happens. Um, Emma Kate, who was our choreographer, um, went with the New Zealand 
uh, the Kiwi All Stars, which is 40 kids auditioned from around New Zealand, and they recently went to New York and Atlanta to perform at the World Junior Theatre Festival. Um, got to perform on the Disneyland stage, work with um, international choreographers and directors. Um, a lot of the the scope of what we're trying to do, especially working with ETNZ, is looking at their new unit standards that they've brought in, is actually allowing, especially our, our 15, 16, 17 year olds, to actually gain unit standard credits through working with the theatre, which makes parents a bit more happy about the amount of hours they spend with us. Thank you. And the last question, I, you'll have, I heard the little ripple around the room when you talked about your Pacifica Māori um, yes. production of Moana, um, which I noted is going to be at the Regent. Yes. So that comes with... Costs yes. is what you're looking for. I was. Um, so does that, maybe follows the question that Councillor Harpeter was asking, does that increased cost change the model that you work with or is it just scaling up it will alter the model obviously i can't charge 12 dollars at the regent otherwise i may as well just tip money down the drain um we are in the process at the moment i've just finished drawing the constitution to turn myth into an incorporated society which allows us a lot more scope to work with business and um i also have an off-site cane who we work with a lot, who just also is on the board of the Regent. So um, we will be looking to partner with the Regent um, to, to achieve that. At the moment, we are very much in developmental stages. My first step with that is to engage with the Māori and Pacific Island leaders to ensure that we do everything to, you know, with the utmost respect and following any protocols that need to be adhered to. That's all the questions. So thank you for coming in to present to us today. Thank you. The um, recommendation is the committee resolve that the presentation be received for information, which I'm happy to move and Councillor Barrett will second. Open that for any comments. So I will wrap that up by saying thank you again to Manu you. Manawatu Youth Theatre and Manawatu Theatre Society. Um, we look forward to seeing your Pirates of Penzance suitably updated um, and also to the productions that the Youth Theatre is bringing to us. 98% sold out. I was delighted to hear that, especially as my sold out figures were challenged last week in this chamber. So, <laughs> noted. Thank you. Can I ask you to vote on that? unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Moving along to confirmation of the minutes, which are on page 11. Committee resolved that the minutes of the Arts, Culture and Heritage Committee meeting of the 10th of June 2020, part one, public, be confirmed as a true and correct record, which I will move, seconded by Councillor Barrett. Any comments on the minutes or questions? That being none, we will put that to the vote. That is 13 votes in favour, nobody against two abstentions. Thank you. So moving to item eight the cultural CCO's final statements of intent for 2020 to 2023. The memorandum presented by Julie McDonald, strategy and policy manager. I'll invite Julie to come forward. The report is at page 17. An officer report to support this and then the statements from each of the CCOs. So as usual, the officers will present their report. We offered the CCOs the opportunity to speak to the changes that have been made between draft and final. So elected members will remember that this is a process that we're in. I'm sure the officers will speak to that. The CCOs are happy not to present because this has all come through the public forum before, but are available to take questions 
should there be any on their specific changes that were requested by council. So over to you, Julie. Thank you. Kia ora koutou, councillors. Um, in three, Madam Chair, just um, recommending that the final statements of intent submitted by the CCOs are approved following the responses to the feedback provided by council in June. Um, and again, apologies for the omission of the information table today. Um, I would note, though, that that information is the same as was provided in June, with the exception of some um, adjustments to inflation that were at the request of council. So you have actually seen that material before. And um, Becca is here, um, is the person who's done all the work on this, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So I will open for questions. Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Manager. Uh, thanks, Julian Becker. Um, can you just um, talk about uh, any differences in the way that we got to this point this year compared to previous years? Um, and just explain at what point members have had an opportunity to contribute to these uh, statements of intent? So, um, hello? Yeah, is that, is that working? Okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, as many of you all know, the, the statement of intent development process is a multi-stage process. Uh, so, uh, over the last few years, um, Council has had an opportunity to draft a letter of expectations, or now called a statement of expectations, um, which is provided to the CCOs. Um, in this case, there was also a workshop with um, Tamanua, the Tamanua Board, between councillors, uh, elected members and, and the Tamanua Board. Uh, once that process has been through the um, the CCOs then have a draft, a first draft of their statement of intent that they um, present to council and that came to council to this committee in um, June. Um, at that stage, uh, elected members have a chance to make comments on that statement of intent and uh, effectively say the things that they would like to see different in that document. Uh, the CCOs then go away um, and work on a new document that they bring um, for approval by council. Thank you, that's very helpful. So I had a couple of questions, if I could. Oh, I'll note you there, the Mr. Mayor. Um, in the report, in the first paragraph, you talk about the process that we're in now, and just noting that at this stage, if we want to change the final statement of intent, um, there are particular process requirements around that under the Local Government Act. Could you explain why that's the case? Uh, sure, so as I, I said before, there is, um, several steps uh, prior to getting to this point. Um, and the, the sort of motivation behind all those steps is that the statement of intent is meant to be a negotiation between council and the CCO, between the two governance bodies. Um, you know, if uh, a CCO wanted to modify their statement of intent, they would have to um, give council the opportunity to, to make comments on that before doing so. And same goes for council, if they want to make any changes, that has to be a negotiated process um, between the two. Uh, part of the motivation for that is, I mean, obviously the statements of intent are already enforced. They've already been enforced for a month, and so any changes at this stage could have effects for the CCOs. Um, I guess the other motivation, uh, so this, so there were some changes in 2019 to the Local Government Act around this process, um, and I think that reflected that increasingly CCOs are, are managed by multiple councils, the, that whole shared service model. So. Um, in order to make sure that there's certainty for all parties and um, everybody gets a chance to have their say um, and have a good working relationship, those those processes are quite clearly legis legislated with um, consultation requirements throughout them. Thank you, Becca. Um, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I've, I've got a number of questions and I, I, I might need either Andy or um, others to, to answer them if that's okay. So, Mr. Mayor, we're keeping questions to changes between from the draft to the final. Yeah. We're clear about that? Yeah. Good. So, so I've got a couple. Um, so we we did ask for some understanding around a visitation plan or campaign for Tamanua, um, and I can't see that. I have asked the chair, and he did say that there was meant to be something there. Um, also, there was an understanding that the, the re-engagement with the core societies, i.e. the art, the, um, the heritage and the science, was to be clearly identified, along with partners, uh, including the New Zealand Rugby Museum and the Palmerston North Defence Heritage Advisory Group. So now that I might, they may be in the depths of things, but um, as we'd had some issues, um, but that's why we, we had a workshop on it and we understood that they were going to be there. Quite happy to 
take that offline, but um, they need to be, if it's going to be modified, I suppose we need to understand what Tamana will want to do about it. Um, so, so in my view, the um, that level of detail would probably sit in the next layer down. So in the statement of intent, they talk about having um, engagement strategies and the like, um, and the detail about which particular organisations would be involved in that um, would be in those plans that um, Tamana are still working on. So, so when we ask for a visitation plan and considering we're at 29, I mean, we're just, there's some quite different, big differences in numbers on, on the um, on the financials that have come through and bearing in mind, we've only just seen these five minutes ago. Um, I think that's excuse, quite Excuse a large me, Mr. One. Mayor, I'm just going to clarify that we haven't only just seen these five minutes ago. I think the officer commented. Can you just say again, Julie, what the difference is in those financials? There are some minor differences in the financials, but my understanding is that what's been provided today is table today is um, the same as what you've seen in June when you commented. Exactly the same. Except for the adjustments for inflation as requested by council. Okay. All right. Okay, that's fine. Okay, I'll still go back to the visitation plan. So we, we, we had, I mean, I can recall a workshop online, which I actually facilitated. And that was a clear request. Uh, my understanding is Tamanua are still working on those. There were several plans and strategies that were requested and that they are still working on them and we'll have them done by the end of this year. This year? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's okay. okay. Any further questions? Any questions that anyone would like to address specifically to one of the trust boards who are represented today? Okay. Thank you both. You can step down. So two recommendations um, from the officer's report that the memorandum entitled Cultural CCO's Final Statements of Intent 2020 23 reported to Arts, Culture and Heritage on the 12th of August be received. And secondly, that the final statements of intent submitted by the cultural CCOs brackets, be approved. I'm happy to move both of those, I'm seeking a seconder. Councillor Barrett will second, and I'll open that for any comments. Mr. Mayor, you wanted to comment. Um, yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Look, I would like to um, put a notice of motion up that um, we request a modification on the Tamano SOI in consultation with the board. There's some serious um, uh, gaps and they just haven't been answered. And the officer, I, so, sorry, I just don't accept the officer's um, answer that we'll have a look at it. Um, and, and sorry, it's not being personal, but this is um, $3.2 million worth of ratepayers' money. And we're going to have a look at the visitation campaign and plan at the end of the year. Um, the numbers are seriously um, through the floor. So, and Tamano are trying their best to lift it, but they do need some focus, and we need to be able to give them some direction on that. That's our role as elected members, to just sit by and just tick this off as if it's okay, is I think slightly foolish. So, I would like to put a notice of motion if I have a seconder on that that um, uh, we we reconvene with the um, board of Tamano and get an understanding of that's where we want to go. Thank you. Um, can you bring that forward in, yeah. in writing? Because of the place in the process that we are, there are particular legislative requirements around seeking a modification at this point, so we just need to check we get that yeah, word I've, in. I've Correct. sought that this morning as well, Excellent. and, and um, I've asked officers, and I'm, I'm an, I understand I'm, I'm, I'm in my rights to do that. Absolutely. Um, please. Write that down and bring it forward and we'll, once we've got those words on the screen, we can look for a seconder. Um, any further comments on the recommendations in front of us? Councillor Johnson. Uh, yes, sir. I'd just like to say that I um, valued the opportunity to have the elected member workshop with Tamanua. And I thought that it gave a great opportunity for all of us to discuss any areas that we might have of concern and for Tamanua to uh, respond to those and take them on board. And it seemed to me to be a very sort of um, 
a good a thing that took faith in uh, took place in good faith. And so uh, I'm a little bit surprised to see a notice of motion coming forward from the mayor now to uh, relitigate um, something that we all agreed on earlier. So um, I think when you're looking at visitation numbers, um, we have to take into account that we had a period of lockdown earlier this year, and of course um, that has seriously affected numbers. So um, I think as the officers outlined, we had a multi-stage process. We went through the statement of expectations, the workshop with the Tamanawa board, uh, the draft that was presented in June, at which time we had a chance to make any comments and uh, any differences be noted. And now we've got the new document today. So I think we've gone through a very robust process and um, I certainly um, am surprised to hear the comments that have come from the mayor. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Anybody else like to comment at this stage? Councillor Rutherford? We're just taking comments on these two. I'll give people an opportunity to comment when the mayor puts up his recommendation. Would there be yes. an opportunity to ask questions around process with, in relation to the notice of motion? Well, I've not seen the notice of motion yet, so I can't tell what the process issues might be. So yes, when there's a notice of motion on the screen, we'll have a look at what the process will be. Does it looks like something is happening over there? While we're just waiting for that to come up, I'll comment on what we've got in front of us. Um, we are slightly out of the normal flow of these reports this year because of the COVID lockdown. And um, elected members will remember from the discussion in June that all of our CCOs have been impacted at different degrees by the, the period of lockdown and the uncertainty around that. Um, even the time that we gave them for doing their statements of intent had to be extended because of the issues um, that they faced as a volunteer board in gathering to do this quite substantial piece of work. So I want to take this opportunity before we get into whatever's coming next to say thank you for that piece of work, um, for the way our boards have engaged with the council. Um, noting that council internally has taken a slightly different approach as came out in some of the questions this year between um, the operational relationship management and the policy work on supporting organisations through their statements of intent. So thank you to our CCOs and our boards for getting us to this point today. Um, I'll note that I still haven't seen the recommendations. I'm, I might come to comment on that later, but I will note that in our um, discussion of the draft back in June, we made a number of changes to the drafts, and um, particularly for Tumanua and also the Regent, um, but also for Cache Birch and the Globe, particularly in those two cases, reflecting on their request for additional funding. And we, you'll remember that we referred that off um, to the long-term plan and asked those organisations to go back to their original figures. So there are a lot of changes proposed, um, and you'll see in the paper um, but the officer has tracked through what those changes were and how those are reflected in the statement of intent. And I have to say, you know, as I went through comparing those things, it wasn't a direct read across. Um, you couldn't just tick it and go, yes, that's been done. But the officer explained how it had been done in their professional opinion. And I note that the staff consider that all the comments had been adequately addressed in the final statement of intent. So on that basis, I'm quite happy with the recommendations in front of us, but we'll look to see what the additional notice is looking like. Okay, so the notice of motion I think is available. Do you want to pop that up, Natalia? It says, um, as it's moved by uh, the mayor, seconded by Councillor Harpeter, I think, yes, um, that the, the notice of motion is that council request a modification to the Timanua Museum's Trust Statement of Intent 2020 to 23 through consultation 
with the Tamanua Museums Trust Board. Now that is a not notice of motion which will only come into play should the second recommendation fail because the first and second recommendations have already been moved and seconded. So we need to go to one and two. My intention would be to take we will take one first, because that's just to receive the report. So I'll ask you to vote on one. That's carried unanimously. The second recommendation has moved and seconded by me and Councillor Barrett, um, is that the final statements of intent submitted by this cultural CCOs, which is attachments one to four for one for each one of the cultural CCOs, um, be approved. So we will put that motion as it stands. Um, Madam Chair, sorry to interrupt, please. Um, could we just have a staff comment on the implications of voting against this in terms of the legislative process if we then go to notice of motion three because i think that might inform some people's vote julie can i ask you to comment please certainly through you madam chair um you'll understand this is really complicated hence the two laptops and much scratching of heads um so our understanding is that if the notice of motion were to succeed, that the um, we would enter into that consultation process again. Um, I mean, I can go through the details, but the upshot is that the next statement of intent would be due back to staff in around March, due to the steps that would need to happen between now and then. So I'm happy to provide more detail if you need it. Sorry, Julie, this statement of intent wouldn't come back till March. Isn't that when they would do it anyway? That would be next year's one. Um, so the uh, this statement of intent, if it was to be modified, and we let you know, give all parties time time to do that, it would be sort of the end of the year that we would get that. And then, of course, if council wanted to see this modified statement of intent, it wouldn't be able to go until February. And then, yes, um, as you you said, the next statement of intent is due on the first of March, on or before. Okay, thank you, Councillor Dennison. Just wanted to confirm with the mayor whether he wanted that intention to have that as a notice of motion or that it'd be part of two subject to uh, the notification of the amendment to the Tamanua. It seems like that's the intent is that we want to consider that first rather Sorry, than Councillor Dennison, all of those have been moved and seconded, so we're not talking about that now. No, but I, I'm just querying with the mayor, did you intend it to be an amendment to what's been moved in two rather than a notice of motion. Councillor Dennison, the Mayor clearly said that he gave notice of motion. I accepted it as a notice of motion, so I don't think the question of his intent is in play at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Beatty. Um, so Madam Chair, can I... May I seek clarification, please? Um, we will need to separate Tamanawa out of that if we wish to vote for, because I may wish to vote against that but it's all tied up with the other three ccos yes it is so we'll put it's moved and seconded and we'll vote on it as is if it fails then we'll separate them all out so we'll take tamanua separately and the so other three could separately. we not just separate tamanua out of that now no it's moved and seconded and i'm happy with that uh, councillor rutherford i have a question in relation to um the process so is there an opportunity, because this is a recommendation to council, this committee does not have delegation to make this decision, is there an opportunity that um, we can sign off the remaining three CCOs and that, um, I guess the question is around the, the time frame 
to prepare a report to council which would enable a conversation to clarify the um, visitor aspect with Tamanawa and have their SOI presented directly through to council. My, my question is, is there an opportunity to consider that? Um, can I ask you, Julie, to comment on that? I suppose my concern here is at what stage would we trigger this, the LGA requirements to formally consult again? So if, if there's a if there's a resolution, yes, you could agree um, all the statements of intent of the other CCOs and decide to trigger a further consultation process with Tamanawa. If there's an agreement to do that at council, then that consultation would happen, say, September. I'm just trying to map out a time frame here. Um, the consultation, well, council would need to agree what it was consulting on because that's not clear yet. Then there would need to be the consultation with the trust. Then there would need to be a resolution to modify the statement of intent at, in October. Um, and then there'd be, that would need to be, um, go back to the trust to prepare and adopt a modified statement of intent, sort of December, January. Sorry, I was I probably didn't ask the question very no, I clearly. Might not be helping. Um, <laughs> I, I guess what I'm wanting to know is if all four statement of intents were to go to this uh, to council, the full council meeting at the, at the end of the month. Yes. Three of those endorsed by this committee as a recommendation from this committee. But if we were to put to Manawa aside so that a conversation could happen, so I guess I'm not talking about a formal consultation or going down, I guess I'm talking about the fact of um, getting some clarity on the issue of the um, visitor aspect, um, which as the Mayor's highlighted came through earlier discussions um, and there was a level of expectation that that would be included. Is there an opportunity to clarify whether that was supposed to be included? And so perhaps it was an administrative error that it was missed off the statement of intent and therefore the statement of intent would be amended to um, address that and that would go directly through to council. I see. To this, bypass this committee. I see what you're saying. The staff advice is that we are happy that the, that the issues raised by councillors are appropriately addressed in the statement of intent. So if councillors wish to reach further agreement about further issues to raise, know there's been no administrative oversight, the, the staff advice stands in terms of the statement of intent. Yeah, sorry, I, I wasn't asking for um, the staff advice. I think you've given that very clearly. I appreciate that. I'm more asking around in terms of time frames. Is it doable? I appreciate it would be tight, but is it doable to, to have that in time for the essentially the agenda meeting that'll happen with the mayor for sign off for the council meeting at the end of the month. Just one moment. I think we might just take a five minute adjournment here while the officers try and plan out the best way of handling this, bearing in mind they're in a complex legal framework because of the state mm -hmm. status of this report. So just five minutes, please, people.
button. Right, elected members, if we can gather back together. I think we have um, found a way through this. Um, the governance administrators are just typing up a, a change to the notice, and we'll talk about how that's going to work. While they're doing that, Maxine has asked if she could make a statement from the Globe. So I'm allowing that to fill the time. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, councillors. Um, I was going to ask to have this um, read out if um, we actually took questions, but we aren't going to take questions. Um, the Globe Theatre has been able to swiftly and positively return to pre-COVID bookings and venue use. This is a direct result of the two theatre size that allows for hires to plan dates and organise performances and events more quickly. For example, an event can be organised today and dated today and be on the stage next Saturday. Our heart goes out to our fellow CCOs, in particular the Regent and Casey Birch. It would be usual for their hires to need much more long-term planning and organisation to hold the, the types of events that their venues cater for, also to to Tamanawa and the Rugby Museum. Whilst there is much encouragement for New Zealanders to visit local and national places of interest such as these, they must surely be feeling the pinch of the loss of international visitors. The Globe Theatre does not in any way wish for their successful recovery to be used as a measure or a comparison, as that we would believe would be grossly unfair given the degree of flexibility the Globe enjoys that is simply not available to the other CCOs, and we wish them all well during this most difficult time. Thank you, Maxine, for that. And well done. I'm getting stood back up so quickly, and we really hope that whatever is coming next um, that our CCOs can ride through as well as they have the current situation. So thank you. So we're just waiting for some amendments to come. Um, elected members, standing order 3.10.6, a notice of motion may be altered only by the mover with the consent of the meeting. With the consent of the meeting, Councillor Barrett and I would indicate that we will remove Timanoa specifically from item two and seek to take that separately. Can I seek your consent on the voices? All those in favour, aye, good, thank you. Um, the Mayor has also indicated that under 3.10.6, he would seek to alter his notice of motion to provide greater specificity about the areas where he has specific concerns. Again, on the voices, are you happy to accept that change to the notice of motion? All those in favour, say aye. Thank you. So I'll take that as confirmation that we can alter the notices of motion. And um, that is what governments are working on at the moment. So item two will become the final statements of intent for Regent, Keisha Birch and Globe. And we'll take Timanua separately. And then if the Timanua separate motion fails, then the amended notice of motion from the Mayor and Councillor Harpeter will be put And for clarity, the general manager has confirmed that she expects that will be able to come to council in September, not the end of the year as indicated. So that to become number three. So attachments two, three, and four are listed here for the Regent of Acacia Birch and the Globe Theatre Trust. Oh, it's gone back to be number two. So we will vote on that, please. That's carried unanimously. Thank you.
the um, the next recommendation should be the same uh, final statement of intent for Porto Manoa on its own. That's the notice of motion. We need the. Yep, it was already moved and seconded, so we're going with that. I've just separated them out. Yes. Thank you. So that's the separated out part of that recommendation, just that the final statement of intent for Tamanoa Museums Trust Board be approved. So we'll put that motion, and if it fails, then the notice of motion will come forward. Madam Chair, um, are you taking comments at this point? Mm. I feel like we have commented on this quite extensively. So we'll put that to the vote, please. And that is carried by 10 votes in favour with five against. So the Tamanua final statement of intent is approved and the notice of motion lapses. Thank you. So we move to the next item on the agenda, which is the annual report from Palmerston North Sculpture Trust memorandum presented by Sandra King. And Sandra, I think you have Simon with you as there, Sandra. Simon, are you joining? Excellent. Welcome. Come take a seat with Sandra at the front. Madam Chair, I'd like to also invite Peter Sheldon to join us as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Simon and Peter, very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon, councillors, at the end of a very long day. I'd like to introduce Peter, um, Peter Shelton from the Palmerston North Public Sculptures Trust and Simon Barnett is the chair of the Public North Public Sculpture Trust. The memo I've presented is, is their report, so I'd like to hand over to Simon and Peter to talk to it. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I haven't got much more to add than what's on the the report. So what I'd like to do is take this opportunity to make sculpture a little bit more real to you. So this may take a bit of strength, but I think it's going to be worth it. Hold on one moment, please.
So quite a number of the sculptures in the city are made out of bronze, and what you've got there is an ingot of the raw from the Dibble foundry, I think, and then a marquette of the sculpture that sits on the lawn to the west of us here, um, which is called Pacific Monarch. So I thought it was interesting for the one that is uh, now in outside wild base, as you know, is a dibble and is made of this material. So what you probably don't know is exactly what's involved in the material itself and, of course, the artistic addition. So the sculptures sit around the city, that's fine, you look at them, but there's a lot that goes into them. And I just thought it would be an interesting thing for you to, to feel what it's like to... Uh, to make something associated with sculpture of this nature anyway. So I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> We're just going to fetch some hand sanitizer. Um, thank you. I've Never carried Pacific Monarch before, and I'm glad it was the small version that you brought in. Um, are there any questions for the Sculpture Trust, please? Councillor Naylor. Thank you for the report, and thank you for um, coming to see us today. Just a question around the financials on page 97. Um, the balance at the end of the year, the 31,000, um, obviously the amount of money that came in you didn't need to use it all. And so what's what's the plans at this stage for, for what's left over? So at the moment we have two sculptures, two more works. You will have seen um, Deep Thinker in the Broadway Square intersection, but we have committed to a partnership with Tamanawa uh, for the head of John Doe and there's money put aside um, in anticipation of that going ahead. We also have um, reasonably advanced conversations with Mary Louise Brown for additions to um, the Streets for People program. Okay, thank you. And just one other quick question. Um, just with the change in the arrangement from um, the, I think it was an MOU, um, to just the arrangement of reporting back annually. Um, so. The mat, what used to be match an agreement to do um, for the Sculpture Trust to have match funding to council, is that um, one is that sort of in the past now, or is that still a part of the expectation or the arrangement or the intent? Our intent is to seek a partnership in matching of some, or maybe not 50-50 as it was okay. strictly in the past. Okay. But our intention yeah. is to partner, as is the case with actually all of these works. Lovely. Thanks for that. Councillor Harpeter. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks very much for all that you do for the city. Um, just, it's a cheeky question, but it's something that really interests me. Just what would be the average spend per sculpture? We try to work within a budget of $100,000. Some are more. Some are substantially more, some are less. But it's very hard to do public sculpture for small sums of money, unfortunately. And second question, if I may, um, you get donations. Do you get donations per annum or do you go and solicit donations or do they just come? I wish they just came. <laughs> no, we solicit them. Right. And I'd have to say that uh, there's it's fair to say that it's a small group of people within the city who have supported this work over the years. I think it's worth reflecting on, on two elements of the, va the now the value, because these are all passed to the city. Um, I could comment on that. I've got some figures here that um, our total insured value for monuments, statutes and sculptures is 7.4 million across the city. Of that, the the Sculptures Trust has contributed over $1.4 million worth of assets, so it's over that 100000 per. They, they vary in terms of the size, but yeah, significant. Some very generous people. Thank you. 
Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good to see you all here. The question that's on my mind is one that um, we traversed a while ago, I think, and just wanted to follow up a bit, which was the online presence um, and an absolutely magnificent uh, website that you have. Um, th the website doesn't really have a, a way of contacting um, the trust, and, and I believe last time I asked a question around it, it seemed that there was a, a level of warmth toward that idea of having a, a means of contacting the trust online. I just wondered, has that been explored? Is there an update on the thinking there around that? So I think it was you that asked that question last time, and for but not, I was going to say for once we listened, I didn't mean that. Um, we've listened to that comment and there's a new website prepared with, which is for ready for approval now. The trustees are just um, approving that. So that has the ability to contact the trust much more directly and is a more modern website with more photos and more interactivity possible. Uh, thanks and that's great to hear and I hope it is also as beautiful as the current one or even more beautiful because I think it looks amazing. It's just that element of contact. So thanks, Madam Chair. No, we decided it was better to redo the, the whole website um, and incorporate that comment into it. Great. Thank you both, Madam Chair. That's covered all of the questions. I, oh, no, sorry, Councillor Butt. I have a funny question probably. Um, looking at the weight of these sculptures and transmitting into the bigger ones, I know they are quite heavy, but can I ask if somebody have ensured them after listening this much value of these sculptures? Or do we have insurance for this? Yes, they are insured through our policy. So. All right, thank you. And just to reassure you about the, the risk of some of them walking, uh, the reason why the base was added to Deep Thinker was that that, uh, that now weighs one point four. So before the base was added, he might have gone wandering without our permission rather than with our permission, which is the intent for that particular work to move around the city and, and pop up. Councillor Naylor, were you indicating a follow-up question? Yeah. Sorry, just one further question. Just still looking at the financials, um, which I was just wanting to understand because um, under the grants, um, my understanding is that PNCC grants 50,000 a year. Uh, Please tell me if I'm wrong, but on on, on this year it says a hundred thousand, and I'm just wondering, um, do you get another fifty thousand from an, uh, what what makes up the other fifty thousand dollar grant? Thank you, Karen. Um, just to let you know, the funding didn't come through the previous year, and so what happened was because we were still talking about an agreement, and so the funding from the previous year was paid, I think, in the July, and then we got another funding, which was later on. So it was just slipped from one year to the other. Okay, okay. can I just follow that up? Because on page 97, on the on the last year, it's got 50,000, and then on this year, it says 100,000. So was that delayed from the previous, from the 17 year as well? Or it just doesn't quite make sense Sorry, Peter, can you use the microphone so the recording picks you up? Yes, the, if you look at all of our years accounts, you'll find one year we had no grant and it oh, slipped okay. forward two, two complete years. Okay, so we're caught up now then. Caught up Lovely. now. Lovely. Thank you for clarifying that. There are no further questions. Thank you for coming in and speaking to the report. Very much appreciated. Thank you for having us. So the recommendation there is this committee resolves that the memorandum entitled Annual Report from the Palmerston North Public Sculpture Trust presented to Arts, Culture and Heritage on the 12th of August be received for information, which I will move. We seconded by Councillor Barrett. I'll open that for any comments. Mr Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, like Councillor Harpeter, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the trust for their work um, and their continuing work. If you if you got the numbers there from the officer, the total value of our our public sculptures um, and public artworks is 7.4 million. But what the trust has added or, or vested um, bequest to the uh, 
to the city is 1.4 million. But in that time, we've only actually, uh, the city's contribution has been 500,000. So that's, um, that's a considerable amount of money, which is extra to uh, what the city has put in. And that's the way um, really successful um, public and private partnerships go. So um, for those that, um, not around this table, but there are, we do get a, we do get the odd little bit of niggle around sculptures. They're seen as um, maybe nice to haves, but actually they, they contribute to the vibrancy of the city hugely. And you imagine if all those pieces around our CBD were not there, it would be, it'd be pretty bland. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, thanks, Simon, um, and your other trustees, Robin Higgins, um, Sue Wettering, um, Tim Mordaunt, and um, Peter Shilton and Bronwyn Zinnemann. Thank you very much for your gifts to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, to echo the Mayor's thanks and appreciation to the Public Sculpture Trust. Um, I think our public sculpture body of work is, is one way um, that we find our place in the world, that we push back against globalisation. If you're in the plaza, you could be in any shopping mall in the Southern Hemisphere. But when you come out into the square, you're definitely in Palmerston North and our public sculpture plays a part in telling that story. So. Yes, no surprise that I'm in favour of public sculpture, um, but also noting you know, that financial implications for us that $500,000 of ratepayer investment has turned into an asset base of $1.4 million, which sits on council's books and enables us to borrow to deliver some of those core infrastructure projects um, that might have a more general acceptance as being um, something that council should be putting ratepayer money into. So our public art is a significant investment program for this council that has financial benefits as well as aesthetic ones. And on both of those fronts, I'm sure we're all absolutely delighted to say thank you to the Public Sculpture Trust for working with us to deliver that for our city. So I will put that to the vote, please. We do only have a couple of items to go, but the administrator advises me that afternoon tea is here. So we will take a short break um, of 10 minutes um, and then get back in and finish off these last couple of items. Thank you. <laughs> 